Chapter Six: An Account of the Persecutions in Italy Under the Papacy, Part Three. Chapter Six, Part Three of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vaughn Ullman. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter Six: An Account of the Persecutions in Italy. Under the Papacy, Part Three. An account of the persecutions in Venice. While the state of Venice was free from inquisitors, a great number of Protestants fixed their residence there, and many converts were made by the purity of the doctrines they professed, and the inoffensiveness of the conversations they used. The Pope, being informed of the great increase of Protestantism in the year fifteen forty two, sent inquisitors to Venice to make an inquiry into the matter. And apprehend such as they might deem obnoxious persons. Hence, a severe persecution began, and many worthy persons were martyred for serving God with purity and scorning the trappings of idolatry. Various were the modes by which the Protestants were deprived of life, but one particular method, which was first invented upon this occasion, we shall describe. As soon as the sentence was passed, the prisoner had an iron chain which ran through a great stone fastened to his body. He was then laid flat upon a plank. With his face upwards, and rowed between two boats to a certain distance at sea, when the two boats separated and he was sunk to the bottom by the weight of the stone. If any denied the jurisdiction of the inquisitors at Venice, they were sent to Rome, where, being committed purposely to damp prisons and never called to a hearing, their flesh mortified and they died miserably in jail. A citizen of Venice, Antonio Ricchetti, being apprehended as a Protestant, was sentenced to be drowned in the manner we've already described. A few days previous to the time appointed for his execution, his son went to see him, and begged him to recant that his life might be saved, and himself not left fatherless. To which the father replied, "A good Christian is bound to relinquish not only goods and children, but life itself, for the glory of his Redeemer. Therefore, I am resolved to sacrifice everything in this transitory world, for the sake of salvation in a world that will last to eternity." The lords of Venice likewise sent him word. That if he would embrace the Roman Catholic religion, they would not only give him his life, but redeem a considerable estate which he had mortgaged, and freely present him with it. This, however, he absolutely refused to comply with, sending word to the nobles that he valued his soul beyond all other considerations, and being told that a fellow prisoner named Francis Sega had recanted, he answered, "If he has forsaken God, I pity him, but I shall continue steadfast in my duty." Finding all endeavors to persuade him to renounce his faith ineffectual. He was executed according to his sentence, dying cheerfully, and recommending his soul fervently to the Almighty. What Ricchetti had been told concerning the apostasy of Francis Sega was absolutely false, for he had never offered to recant, but steadfastly persisted in his faith, and was executed a few days after Ricchetti in the very same manner. Francis Spinola, a Protestant gentleman of very great learning, being apprehended by order of the inquisitors, was carried before their tribunal. A treatise on the Lord's Supper was then put into his hands, and he was asked if he knew the author of it. To which he replied, "I confess myself to be the author of it, and at the same time solemnly affirm there is not a line in it but what is authorized by and consonant to the Holy Scriptures." On this confession, he was committed close prisoner to a dungeon for several days. Being brought to a second examination, he charged the Pope's legate and the inquisitors with being merciless barbarians, and then represented the superstitions and idolatry practiced by the Church of Rome in so glaring a light. That not being able to refute his arguments, they sent him back to his dungeon to make him repent of what he had said. On his third examination, they asked him if he would recant his error, to which he answered that the doctrines he maintained were not erroneous, being purely the same as those which Christ and his apostles had taught, and which were handed down to us in the sacred writings. The inquisitors then sentenced him to be drowned, which was executed in the manner already described. He went to meet death with the utmost serenity, seemed to wish for the dissolution, and declaring. That the prolongation of his life did but tend to retard that real happiness which could only be expected in the world to come. An account of several different remarkable individuals were martyred in different parts of Italy on account of their religion. John Molius was born at Rome, of, reput of reputable parents. At twelve years of age, they placed him in the monastery of Grey Friars, where he made such a rapid progress in arts, sciences, and languages. That at eighteen years of age he was permitted to take priest's orders. He was then sent to Ferrara, where, after pursuing his studies six years longer, he was made 
theological reader in the university of that city. He now unhappily exerted his great talents to disguise the gospel truths, and to varnish over the error of the Church of Rome. After some years' residence in Ferrara, he moved to the University of Bohonia, where he became a professor. Having read some treatises written by ministers of the Reformed religion, he grew fully sensible of the errors of popery, and soon became a zealous Protestant in his heart. He now determined to expound, accordingly to the purity of the gospel, St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, in a regular course of sermons. The concourse of people that continually attended his, his preaching was surprising, but when the priests found the tenor of his doctrines, they dispatched an account of the affair to Rome. When the Pope sent a monk named Cornelius de Bohonia to expound the same epistle, according to the tenets of the Church of Rome, the people, however, found such a disparity between the two preachers that the audience of Molius increased, and Cornelius was forced to preach to empty benches. Cornelius wrote an account of his bad success to the Pope, who immediately sent an order to apprehend Molius, who was seized upon accordingly and kept in close confinement. The Bishop of Honia sent him word that he must recant or be burnt, but he appealed to Rome and was removed hither. At Rome he begged to have a public trial, but that the Pope absolutely denied him and commanded him to give an account of his opinions in writing, which he did under the following heads, Original Sin, Free Will, The Infallibility of the Church of Rome, The Infallibility of the Pope, Justification by Faith, Purgatory, Transubstantiation, Mass, Auricular Confession, Prayers for the Dead, The Host, Prayers for Saints, Going on Pilgrimages, Extreme Unction, Performing Services in an Unknown Ton, etc., etc., all these he confirmed from scripture authority. The Pope, upon this occasion, for political reasons, spared him for the present, but soon after had him apprehended and put to death, he being first hanged and his body burnt to ashes, A.D. 1553. The year after, Francis Gamba, a Lombard of the Protestant persuasion, was apprehended and condemned to death by the Senate of Milan. At the place of execution, a monk presented a cross to him, to whom he said, My mind is so full of the real merits and goodness of Christ that I want not a piece of senseless stick to put me in mind of him. For this expression his tongue was bored through, and he was afterward burnt. A.D. 5055 Algerius, a student in the University of Padua, and a man of great learning, having embraced the Reformed religion, did all he could to convert others. For these proceedings he was accused of heresy to the Pope, and, being apprehended, was commended to the prison at Venice. The Pope, being informed of Algerius's great learning and surprising natural abilities, thought it would be of infinite service to the Church of Rome if he could induce him to forsake the Protestant cause. He, therefore, sent for him to Rome, and tried, by the most profane promises, to win him to his purpose. But finding his endeavors ineffectual, he ordered him to be burnt, which sentence was executed accordingly. A.D. 1559. John Elisois, being sent from Geneva to preach in Calabria, was there apprehended as a Protestant, carried to Rome and burnt by order of the Pope, and James Vovelius, for the same reason, was burnt at Messina. A.D. 1560. Pope Pius IV ordered all the Protestants to be severely persecuted throughout the Italian states, when great numbers of every age, sex, and condition suffered martyrdom. Concerning the cruelties practiced upon this occasion, a learned and humane Roman Catholic thus spoke of them in a letter to a noble lord. I cannot, my lord, forbear disclosing my sentiments, with respect to the persecution now carrying on. I think it cruel and unnecessary. I tremble at the manner of putting to death, as it resembles more the slaughter of calves and sheep than the execution of human beings. I will relate to your lordship a dreadful scene, of which I was myself an eyewitness. Seventy Protestants were cooped up in one filthy dungeon together. The executioner went in among them, picked out one from among the rest, blindfolded him, led him to an open place before the prison, and cut his throat with the greatest composure. He then calmly walked into the prison again, bloody as he was, and with the knife in his hand selected another, and dispatched him in the same manner. And this, my lord, he repeated, until the whole number were put to death. I leave it on your lordship's feelings to judge of my sensations upon this occasion. My tears now wash the paper upon which I give you the recital. Another thing I must mention, the patience with which they met death. They seemed all resignation and piety, fervently praying to God and cheerfully encountering their fate. I cannot reflect without shuddering how the executioner held the bloody knife between his teeth. What a dreadful figure he appeared, all covered with blood, and with what unconcern he executed his barbarous office. A young Englishman, who happened to be at Rome, was one day passing by a church, when the procession of the host was just coming out. A bishop carried the host, which the young man perceiving, 
He snatched it from him, threw it upon the ground, and trampled it under his feet, crying out, You wretched idolaters, who neglect the true God to adore a morsel of bread. This action so provoked the people that they would have torn him to pieces on the spot. But the priests persuaded them to let him abide by the sentence of the Pope. When the affair was presented to the Pope, he was so greatly exasperated that he ordered the prisoner to be burnt immediately. But a cardinal dissuaded him from this hasty sentence, saying that it was better to punish him by slow degrees, and to torture him, that they might find out if he had been instigated by any particular person to commit so atrocious an act. This being approved, he was tortured with the most exemplary severity, notwithstanding which they could only get these words from him, It was the will of God that I should do as I did. The Pope then passed this sentence upon him. 1. That he should be led by the executioner naked to the middle, through the streets of Rome. 2. That he should wear the image of the devil upon his head. 3. That his breeches should be painted with the representation of flames. 4. That he should have his right hand cut off. 5. That after having been carried about thus in the procession, he should be burnt. When he heard this sentence pronounced, he implored God to give him strength and fortitude to go through it. As he passed through the streets, he was greatly derided by the people, to whom he said some severe things respecting the Romish superstition. But a cardinal who attended the procession, overhearing him, ordered him to be gagged. When he came to the church door, where he trampled on the host, the hangman cut off his right hand and fixed it to a post. Then two tormentors with flaming torches scorched and burned his flesh all the rest of the way. At the place of execution he kissed the chains that were to bind him to the stake. A monk, presenting the figure of a saint to him, he struck it aside, and then, was, and then being chained to the stake, fire was put to the faggots, and he was soon burnt to ashes. A little after the last-mentioned execution, a venerable old man, who had long been a prisoner in the Inquisition, was condemned to be burnt, and brought out for execution. When he was fastened to the stake, a priest held a crucifix to him on which he said, If you do not take that idol from my sight, you will constrain me to spit upon it. The priest rebuked him for this with great severity, but he bade him remember the first and second commandments, and refrain from idolatry, as God himself had commanded. He was then gagged that he should not speak any more. The fire being put to the faggots, he suffered martyrdom in the flames. An account of the persecutions in the Marquisat of Saluces. The Marquisat of Saluces, on the south side of the valleys of Piedmont, was in A.D. 1561 principally inhabited by Protestants, when the Marquis, who was proprietor of it, began a persecution against them at the instigation of the people, of the Pope. He began by banishing the ministers, and if any of them refused to leave their flocks, they were sure to be imprisoned and severely tortured. However, he did not proceed so far as to put them to death. Soon after the Marquisat fell into possession of the Duke of Savoy, who sent circular letters to all the towns and villages, that he expected people should all conform to go to Mass, the inhabitants of the Seleucids, upon receiving this letter, returned a general epistle in answer. The Duke, after regard reading the letter, did not interrupt the Protestants for some time, but at length he sent them word that they must either conform to the Mass or leave his dominions in fifteen days. The Protestants, upon this unexpected edict, sent a deputy to the Duke to obtain his revocation, or at least have it moderated, but their remonstrances were in vain, and they were given to understand that the edict was absolute. Some were weak enough to go to Mass, in order to avoid banishment and preserve their property. Others removed with all their effects to different countries. And many neglected the time so long they were obliged to abandon all they were worth, and leave the Marquisat in haste. Those who unhappily stayed behind were seized, plundered, and put to death. End of chapter 6, part 3. Recording by Von Ullman. V-O-N-S-T-A-K-E-S dot blogspot dot com.